that was discovered a long time before the computer was invented. It was mentioned already by Jalal de Rumi and some of our great poets and troubadours of love. As for love, it is a reality that transcends whatever one writes about it. As Rumi said, when it comes to love, the pen breaks and the ink dries up. And yet, so much has been written about the subject. One can either write nothing or fill libraries about love. But finally, one must experience love to know what it is and then just speak about it. Love attaches the lover to the beloved, carries the lover through dales and valleys of joy and sorrow, and finally leads to a union that is also a kind of death for amor es mors, as the medieval adage went, that is, love is death. The love of God is not only the highest form of love, but in reality the only love of which all other loves are but shadows. To love God fully is to give ourselves wholly to him, body, soul, and mind, not to speak of will and intelligence. We must give up our limited egos as that which defines us. The end of that love is what the Christian mystics call mystical union, and to which Sufis refer in a somewhat different language, but concerning the same reality as being consumed by the fire of love, as a moth, moth is immolated by the consuming flames of the divine candle. For the purpose of our present discourse, it can be said that in the same way that it is not necessary to enter into contentious theological discussions about the nature of God, there is no need to enter into an analysis of the modes, stages, and states of love. Let us love God and leave the mystery of this attachment of each soul to its creator, to the creator himself. At all costs, we should avoid considering a love of God to be superior to the love of the other for God. Such an illusory contention arises from our mistaking our own understanding of the love of God for the love itself, and absolutizing that understanding, and thereby inflating our egos in the guise of religious devotion and righteousness. Let us love God and leave him to decide on the intensity and sincerity of our loves, as well as of our different views of him. The Quran invites Muslims explicitly to live at peace with followers of other religions, then let God decide on the day of judgment concerning the truth or falsehood of wherein they differed. As for the love of the neighbor, this command has been understood in a different manner over the ages. Today, it cannot include only our Muslim neighbor for Muslims, Christian neighbors for Christians, or Jewish neighbors for Jew Jews. It must also include father, followers of other religious communities and even non-religious communities and especially the non-human world. In fact, if Muslims and Christians do not speak of the other groups, uh, if I are not to speak of other groups, do not extend their love of the neighbor to the natural world, the consequences of the environmental crisis caused, in fact, by the lack of the love of the neighbor in its larger sense will make all other efforts more or less irrelevant. I've been a champion of the environmental movement for 50 years. I cannot fail to, to let us mention this, that today the love of a neighbor must include not only our cats and dogs or our pets, but also the eagle that flies in the sky, and who, which we shall never see nearby. The Quran asserts that God created all of humanity from a single soul, nafs wahida. Nevertheless, strife even within a single family, not to speak of between religions and nations, continues to manifest itself. One might say that as a result of what Muslims call the fall and Christians' original sin, the state of confrontation and strife is endemic to the human condition. But God has also given us through his grace, through his grace, the means of transcending the abode of strife for one of, the, for one of peace, of overcoming the religious and ideological exclusivism, which now endangers our human existence in favor of that inclusivism of which we, we are gathered here as partisans. It is not, however, enough to speak of a common word between us and you, or even to accept this tenets with our tongues. We must also have the correct intention and live these commandments within ourselves while setting others uh, right and setting examples for them. Otherwise, this whole meeting is really a waste of time. Let us love God and all our, with all our being, 
and with all our means, and also to accept this unity and the unity of the world that unites us. And let us love the neighbor, and most specifically our Muslim and Christian neighbors, not on the basis of mere sentimentality, which can weaken our strength in time, nor because of expediency, but on the never-changing foundation of the truth. To live fully as a Muslim or Christian today does not require anything less of us than loving the neighbor, whether he or she be Muslim or Christian. And to ask not, is he or she one of us, but is he or she one of his? Thank you.